when that happens. Um, we have these little doors for pets so the dog can go out of the house but not back in again. Um, that's how we want to manipulate our robots. There's a lot of related research, uh, tray tilting, um, where uh, these guys are based in an urban and put an L-shaped wrench in a tray, and then they just tilt the tray a number of different ways. It's just like that squeeze grasping I talked about. Um, and so after a few tilts, they can guarantee that the wrench is always in the same orientation. Well, now it's kind of like imagine putting a motor on the wrench and letting it just run around wildly. That's kind of how it's related to that. Um, there's also ideas of virtual fences for herds and animals, um, manipulation by vibration, um, and even strategies for evacuating buildings for really trying to control the flow of humans in an emergency. So that's some related research on this. Here's, here's the method. We divide the environment into regions and gates. So let's say, I should say the environment and obstacle. We partition, oh yeah, the environment is divided into regions and gates. So there's an obstacle region, there's a fun, sorry, an obstacle set, I should say here, because I'm going to formally define a region as these R1 through R5, for example, just some connected subsets of the, um, of the free space here. And then um, we have some finite set of gates. The regions themselves can be multiply connected, I don't really care, whatever. But, um, when we're done, we want a bipartite graph that looks like that, where there's two types of nodes, gates and regions. It's bipartite because I'm not going to allow gates to be adjacent, and I'm not going to allow regions to be adjacent. If you want to go from one region to another, you have to go through a gate. Just like if I want to go from this room to that hallway out there, I have to go through a doorway. So the gates are kind of like doorways. Here's the great framework. And I say great because I'm kind of laughing a bit here, right? So here it is. If you design some wild bodies, wild bodies, and you place them into regions, and then you design some gates to control them. So I induce some kind of flow with the gates. It's like a hybrid system for people who like uh, control systems. You may like hybrid systems in addition, which mix discrete and continuous components. But it's quite an unusual kind of hybrid system, I would say. We made four different classes of gates. We made up this kind of categorization of gates. We have what we call static gates, pliant gates. Pliant is like uh, the word comply. It just goes along with the flow somehow. I'll show you. Uh, controllable gates, where we actually put motors on the gates and do some interesting things. And then we virtualize the whole idea of gates to, to obtain a broader class of, of, of possible robot systems. Static gates. So here's a static gate. It's just a few pieces of paper. Much like trying to control the dog there. So we made some gates like that, and then we compute a discrete flow, I don't know, using breadth-first search, who cares, right? And so that will get you to flow to some region. Very simple. So let me show you an experiment we did. We can show you one body that we manipulated, but I'll show you six. So again, we can say this is really fancy. This is multiple robot coordination, distributed, no communication, and so forth. We can make it sound really fancy, right? So, but but here's, here's all we did. We just uh, got some pieces of paper and some bricks and some weasel balls. And um, it was a very interesting time. Um, uh, my students were arguing in the lab. There was one um, PhD student I have, Leonardo Bobadilla. He was thinking that it should be complicated to do this. And there was a woman in the lab, Katrina Gossman, an undergraduate. who said, no, no, it's very simple. It'll work with paper. And so, well, she proved it by, by building this. And within an hour, they had this video to settle the argument. The goal is to get all of these balls to that region up there. And this is really the first video we made. I mean, just no, we did not try it a hundred times and just show you, like, just whatever, you know, we just tried it. And it works quite reliably. I'll speed it up a little bit. This is double speed, I think. One of the balls will go backwards, which is kind of, funny uh, when that happens. You should be able to see there. <laughs> you know, who cares? We're just playing around, right? So, you know. they're, they're just about to stop it now. They're arguing about whether or not to stop the video. Because you guys, no, that's how this works. You know, it's fine. <laughs> we don't care too much. So it's not supposed to happen, but who cares? We made better dates later, and it never happened again, of course. But, um, you know. 
this probability complete, okay? Because they... I see no probabilities in this at all. No, I mean, in the sense of... Uh, it's complete. Yeah. It works. Deterministically. I think. Come on, go white. Hooray! <laughs> You can hear the students laughing. They can't believe it themselves. Yes? What's the use of this? The use of this? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. You're not supposed to ask such questions. No, sorry. I will show some possible uses in a little while, okay? But uh, let's say this is fundamental robotics. I'm showing that you can do a lot of kinds of tasks that, um, that people spend a lot of time on with very, very simple systems. That's my. That's the purpose of this. The goal is to understand what's necessary to do this. I, I'm going to show you later versions that have more sensors, other things on them and stuff. But understand that for the basic purposes of navigation, patrolling, all kinds of things, you don't need very much. I, I will answer your questions. I'm just kind of teasing you. Sorry about that. But but um, in a little bit later. Uh, all right. That's the second attempt to get the purpose. Right? All right. Um, it doesn't have to be these balls. So for example, this is a popular toy, they're like little vibrating bugs, like cockroaches, that kids like to play with. It's called a hex bug. I decided to take ten of them, that's my hand there, and just um, make them all go to this white area here. And I built this little environment for them, made out of these, these are like little tiny steps, and they just fall down. So what is that? I, I manipulated ten robots if you want. Again, they have no sensors. They just vibrate. They have rubber feet, so they tend to move forward. Sometimes they get stuck moving around in circles, stupid stuff like that. So what is the dimension of the configuration space? Well, each one is a rigid body, six dimensions. That's a 60-dimensional configuration space. Wow, that's really hard. You know, so. <laughs> Done. Again, I didn't do I just I just stood there with a the camera, made a quick experiment, very easy. Right? Again, what's the what, what's this good for, right? <laughs> now, let's see. Okay, who like in six? I'm sorry? Uh, I say they would like insects. Yeah, they were like that. Yeah. <laughs> like insects, that's true. That's a, remember that thought. So. <laughs> we can do patrolling strategies, like they go around through a, a cycle of regions over and over again. I won't show that. Kind of simple. Um, we got crazy and did 50 of them. Um, the, the factory in Guangzhou really likes us. We order giant boxes of weasel balls every couple of months. So, um, this video is not very good. It took about 40 minutes for all the balls. They go to some region down here. So let me just show some part of it just to give you an idea. It worked just fine. We put obstacles, all kinds of crazy stuff, narrow corridors, you know, it's fine. So it really just works. What could possibly be next, right? Let's see. So, um, client, client gates. Here the idea is that every gate has a mode. And based on its mode, it decides whether or not to let bodies go by. It lets them go in different directions, possibly. Uh, so here's a simple uh, client gate design. This one is um, oriented so that um, the ball can move from left to right. It's like, an, it's like an L shape, right? So when it's like, in that configuration, it's like that. When the ball goes through, it'll rotate like that. And then when it does that, if another ball comes along, it can't move, it's blocked. But a ball can go from right to left. So that's how the mode of the game changes based on the ball. It's pliant because this is made out of cardboard and a drinking straw. You know, like you put in your cola, you know? That's the straw that's it. I, I can show you a video of that if you can get an idea of it. It's like a flip flop. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It has, it has some kind of memory, right? Like one bit of memory. So right now, right to left is, is allowed, correct? I know. There's so many balls there, this is not a good, good one, but it's fine. You can see that it's just cardboard and a straw. Okay, so there you go. Change the mode. So here's, here's a question. Um, can I get 
any ball to go back and forth any number of times? Yes. But the number of balls on both sides must remain roughly constant, right? I can only change the number of balls by one. So here's a very interesting question. You know the problem of balls in boxes, in combinatorics, right? Or balls and urns. How many balls? If I have 100 balls in five boxes, how many different ways can I put the balls in? So how many different ball distributions can I get? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, oh, yeah, that's true. If they're indistinguishable, that's very nice. So, um, and if the balls are labeled, then I can get all kinds of interesting possibilities, right? But the number has to be roughly the same. And if, if okay, that, that was very fast, too. Very good. Let me give you the next homework problem. So, so here we go. Uh, let's make a crazy game for you, because you, you, you got the answer quickly. Um, let's make a four-way partially revolving door and see if you can figure out what distributions are possible with that one. Um, so you can see that, that that thing can only rotate 90 degrees, right? The balls are very excited. They want to get away. <laughs> we have trouble even starting the videos. They're ready to go. All right, so what, what distribution of balls, how many are different distributions are possible for this one? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Right? So there's very interesting theoretical questions you can ask here, right? For different types of client gates, what distributions are possible? What does the transition diagram look like? Or the transition graph of all possible distributions that are reachable look like? What kind of gates can I even design? I don't know. All kinds of interesting exchanges you can do between the balls. So there's some fun with client gates. I don't know the answer to the question either, so let's just figure it out. All right, tell me, please. Um, okay, then we made controllable gates. So the idea here is that we have actuators. We actually have motors that change the mode based on their own decisions in the environment. Like that door might just decide to close for some reason. What reason might it use? Well, it needs information. Why don't we use information states? Well, I'll get to that in just a moment, that what information is used. So the modes could be different modes like we've talked about, right? Block, passage, left, allow left to right, allow right to left, maybe allow bidirectional. So we have all of these modes out there. We have a giant mode space, and we have to ask what information do we use to set the modes? I could use timing. I could say for, for two minutes we'll keep the modes one way, and then for two minutes we'll change them to another way. Or I can use sensor feedback by placing some nice sensors. Here's why our sensor elements. Or any information space you want. So design a simple filter and use it for feedback to control the modes. And then when you control the modes, you will control the bodies. Right? Because they get manipulated by the modes. Here's something we designed that does this. We, um, we made a kind of tilting ramp. You can barely see it right there. It's like a piece of acrylic or plexiglass. And so there, it's, it's, I guess it's tilted like this. That will allow flow from left to right. Here it's level. That blocks it in both directions. This direction, it goes upward. It allows flow from right to left. And the motor we use for that is just something we stole off of a um, remote control car. You know, very simple servo motors. That's all. We just use really cheap junk to, to make our, our stuff. So I don't want to insult my poor students' designs, but our goal is to use very simple components that are very easy to find, right? So, so, uh, so I encourage you to, to try to build things like this. It's very nice, very easy to do. Um, now, um, for sensor feedback, you can almost see it here, maybe. It's a, it's a, it's a laser pointer shunt. So just a, a simple, cheap laser pointer, which also costs about $4. And we shine that at a photo diode. And then when the ball goes by, it break, the ball blocks the beam. And then with a very simple circuit, we can know that a ball went by. That's the observation. A ball went by for each one of the ramps. So by keeping track of that, we, we started to figure out what kind of task can we solve now. Well, it turns out it's at least powerful enough to solve all of the tasks that you can specify with linear temporal logic. Uh, what is linear, linear temporal logic? Well, it's a kind of propositional logic that has some additional notation that means um, um, it has, it has um, um, additional, uh, what do I say, um, operators like uh, until and um, 
I think here's until. It has eventually. So the top one means um, eventually get to pi 1. And pi 1 means region 1. You can do sequencing, like requesting it to visit a sequence of regions. You can do, uh, this one means uh, forever keep doing all of these in here. Visit all of these regions. So um, you can express a number of different tasks like this. And what we showed is that uh, we can take those specifications, which people like to do in hybrid system control theory these days, and convert them into ridiculous weasel wall implementations right, for fun. Right? So very simple systems that implement what looks like very sophisticated uh, tasks. Um, so the, the approach, and you know, we borrowed the first part from other research, is linear temporal logic. So express the task into logic, then use model checking software to convert into a specification in terms of sequences of regions. And then we implement it using controllable gates and sensor feedback, as I described. If there are multiple bodies, then this is like a transition diagram on the space of all balls and boxes, just like we talked about, right? So it turns out that we, we, we can, with this very simple system, and you know, these are meant to be the, um, the gates here. With this very simple system, we can induce any transitions we want on the space of balls and boxes. Like, so any distribution of balls we can achieve. In other words, if you know the number of balls in each region initially, we can make those numbers be whatever you want. And we can, by this simple system, and it, will, it will just happen by putting wild bodies inside and doing the sen sensor feedback. I'll show you a very simple example of it in a movie. So in this particular movie, we say that we want the balls to, to move so that there's one ball per region. There's four regions here. You can see them off the gates tilting a little bit. There's four gates here. Here's one of them. There's, they're at the different places on the clock, like 12, 3, 6, and 9. We want there to be one ball in each region. So as soon as that ball went over, it tilted the ramp so that the other balls cannot go. But this ramp up here is open so that they can go to the left. Excuse me, to the left. I'll speed it up a little bit. If you look, you can see the laser pointer. See, there's the laser pointer. Very simple laser pointer aimed at a photodiode. A very simple circuit. We even built our own circuitry using CPLDs and such to, to analyze the, the, the readings and such. We did not even use a full computer just to be cheap. Show that it's very simple. Um, so that's the idea. We can make any kind of distribution transition like this. So quite powerful. Um, then we virtualize the idea of gates. So now we're getting up to where it might, you might think how it might be useful. So we, we made robots. This is a, called a CERB open source mobile robot design. We enhanced it by putting a bumper on the front and a color sensor looking down. A very simple, cheap color sensor. And then we put colored tape on the floor. And then if the robot sees the tape, the mode can just be something in the robot's brain. For example, in one mode, the robot might think, oh, I should bounce if I see white. But I'll go through red. Red is open. In another mode, it might think red is blocked, and I should bounce from red, and white might be open. So it can change the mode based on its own internal programming. So it virtualizes this idea of a gate. Uh, for example, if I have a, here, here's a two information state filter, very simple. In this information state, white is open and red is closed as a gate. And in this information state over here, white is closed and red is open. If I'm in the first state here and, I, and white is observed, in other words, if I see myself crossing white, then what I do is I transition and white becomes closed and red becomes open. If I start a robot here, what will happen? What will happen? It will just go to the side. It will actually go back and forth. Uh, let me show you a video of that. You can see some couple of robots doing that. So it's a very, very simple strategy for controlling robots. So we find that very appealing. The two robots are not aware of each other. They're just running the same thing. They don't care. One of them gets stuck because, you know, oh, inside of the region it's considered to be wild. 
wildness here, to achieve it, it just spins a random amount if it hits the wall and then goes straight again. So this robot's doing pretty well. This one's getting kind of stupid. Uh, but because it's trying to do these wild motions. But eventually it recovers and it continues because this one's open for it. Oops, they hit each other. They don't care. You know, so this one's on its way patrolling. They both patrol back and forth forever. With a very, very ridiculously simple strategy, right? Because the wildness is doing what we need and the information feedback plan has only two information states. that one. Let me see. Um, remember this filter again? Well, I'm going to use that now to control um, the robots. So here, if the robots are together, I open all the gates, the virtual gates. And here's, here's what I want to do. I want the robots to go patrolling in clockwise order around the regions. And I do not want the robots in the same room together. So if they're in the same room together, I open all the gates until somebody leaves. And then, if, say, say, say one of the robots crossed B, what happens here is then uh, A becomes open and B and C are closed. And then if A is transitioned, then A is closed and B is open. So that continues to cause them to go clockwise, order. But if they ever come up together, then all gates are open until they separate. So that's a, re that's a very simple uh, information feedback plan with only four information states. Transformation. 
So there's a transformation that goes from X to X. That's the dynamic of the system. It's just like taking the control system and integrating it forward until something happens. The something that happens for these problems is that the wall is hit. So, so that's a transformation, right? There's a state you start at, and then you hit the wall. Then you hit another wall. Then you hit another wall. Those are the transformations T that go from state to state. Um, one of the things that you need, and this is important in Hamiltonian mechanics, which is what motivated the study of these, I don't care about it too much, is that um, you need to have measure-preserving transformations, which means if I look at a set A and look at its measure, if I then take the inverse of T, so I look at where I could have come from using the transformation, the set has the same measure. So the measure is not growing or shrinking. The volume is not growing or shrinking when I apply this. Um, well, here's an, here's an interesting idea. It's called a T invariant mod zero. I take some measurable set A, right, for my collection of measurable sets. It's called T invariant mod zero. The following happens. This is the symmetric difference. I look at the symmetric difference between where I came from and where I'm at now. All right? If those sets are essentially the same, in other words, they differ only by measure zero. So if they're essentially the same, um, then it's called a T invariant mod zero, right? Um, all right, so we have that. And if this is true, then it'll also be true if you apply, uh, if you keep applying uh, T a bunch of times, it'll be T to the N invariant mod zero. Um, so here's a definition of ergodic. T, the transformation is ergodic. If every one of these sets that does this, right, the sets that were wherever you came from and where you're at now are essentially the same. If the only sets that do this have either measure zero or measure the entire space, <clears throat> I don't know if I said the whole space is measure one here, but it should be. Um, it doesn't matter, you can normalize it. Then if the only sets for which this happened had measure zero or measure one, in other words, if the set's almost empty or almost the entire space, then uh, the system's called ergodic. Intuitively, that means you cannot find a region that traps it. Let me show you this. Um, so here's an example. So if I, if I look at A here as some subset, and i got to try all possible subsets here, all measurable ones. So I try some measurable subset A. If I apply the transformation T to this, do I escape A or not? And by escaping A, do I leave A in a way so that the symmetric difference is, um, has non-zero measure? If there does not exist such a region, this region can be connected or not. I drew it connected here. But if there does not exist such a region then, um, that traps the system, unless A or its complement is measured zero, so, so some, uh, if there does not exist a, a non-trivial region, let's say A, um, then the systems are gone. Let me give you an example. Let's take S1, the circle, and let's just add numbers on it. So it looks like combining planar rotations. If I start in this blue set here, that's a disjoint set. That's my set A. It's just a four intervals there. If my transformation just adds pi over 2, what happens? I stay in the blue set, right? There's no way to get out. So that pi over 2 is not an ergodic transformation because I found a non-trivial set A that traps the system. Think weasel balls here, right? If we want ergodicity, we want it to be like a weasel ball to always escape the trap. So if I pick an irrational angle, and I mean irrational after you divide by pi, like let's say one radian, what's going to happen when I keep adding that to any element in the blue set? Any ideas? You will escape. And, and when you keep adding and adding and adding, it will fill the entire circle. That's the escaping property. There does not exist, and that doesn't establish ergodicity, but you have to show that there does not exist any set that will trap it. So if I use an irrational angle, you will go around and fill the entire circle densely. This is really neat. So it has that feeling of busting out. Um, there's another nice thing. There's this ergodic theory uh, implies the following. Well, sorry, it doesn't. I'm going to give the definition in the next slide. I say what it implies. Um, if f let f be any um, integrable function, um, there's this idea called the time average. I keep applying the transformation. And then I take the average value of the function. And this is called the space average, which is I take the function, I just integrate it over the domain and normalize it. It turns out that theorem by Birkhoff is that if, if this transformation is ergodic, then these time and space averages are the same. 
which is really amazing. So one implication is that if I just take the um, characteristic function, there's measure zero exception there. If, if, I, if I take the characteristic function, like let's say one inside of A and zero outside, it implies that the frequency of visits to the set A by the body is, is proportional to the measure of A. Isn't that strange? So in other words, if A is twice as big, it'll be visited twice as many times. It doesn't matter where A is. So it's a very strong notion of uniformity. It really nicely uniformly covers the, the, uh, of the space. The ergodicity for this problem here, it's ergodic on the boundary, it turns out. Maybe you've seen problems of polygon illumination before and trying to find dark spots in polygons. Um, very interesting open questions there. That involves the interior, but these, this ergodicity involves the boundary. You will hit it. You will hit all points along the boundary. I'll say all open sets along the boundary and from all directions. Uh, I should say you know, almost all. It, 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 it ends up being a denseness. Um, there's a polygonal version. You like polygons. Oh, don't do that to me. I wrote some Python code. Let me show that. Everybody likes Python, right? Both the programming language and Monty Python. Let's see, um, what's the language is named after? Uh, bounds. So, if you start bouncing a polygon, you get very nice behavior. Right? So this is just, this is the, um, I guess this is visibility with all mirrors, right? And it just goes around and around. So very close connection to visibility here. There are interesting computational geometry questions um, um, in the vicinity of this. Um, you can make a, you know, let D be a simple polygon. Okay, that one. You know, right? So you can make more complicated ones. It'll eventually go around and fill everything. So very nice. So it's been shown that for almost all polygons and almost all initial conditions, the trajectory you get is uh, ergodic along the boundary. So it's a beautiful wild body, let's say. What does it mean to say almost all polygons? Have you ever heard that statement before? You, you have to make a measure space out of the space of all polygons. So a little bit of trickiness there, but you can do it. Make some giant manifold-like thing and, 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 uh, and then talk about the exceptional cases. It's like, in other words, if the polygon's in general position, then, then you're fine, something like that. All right. Well, what's different about our problems? That, that research, that mathematical research is really nice, but um, I don't care about measure-preserving maps. I can make a robot do whatever I want. People care about measure-preserving maps because these billiard problems are motivated by Hamiltonian mechanics, and you need measure-preserving maps to satisfy conservation laws. I don't care about that. Um, also, do I have to bounce exactly like a mirror? Not if I have a robot. If I have a beam of light, okay, you know, you don't have a lot of choices. Maybe you can do specular, maybe diffuse reflections, but I can bounce my robot in many different ways, so I want to open up the possibility for that. Also, maybe ergodicity is too much, what we call overkill. It may be too strong of a requirement. Um, so let's look at exceptions to these. Here's a non-measure preserving map. You just take the number x and double it every time. For almost any real number x between 0 and 1, if I keep doubling it and looking at the result mod 1, it turns out that that's ergodic. So, you know, very simple things like that. So that's a you know, that's a mapping that um, Hamiltonian mechanics people would not like because it violates the first condition. But, hey, I can use it if I want. Maybe there's different bounds. I'm going to go through each one of these three conditions. Over here. So the second one, that the hand is on there, there are many alternative ways to bounce. Well, let's think about it. So alpha is the angle that I come in. I'm coming into the wall, right, like this, angle alpha. And then I um, have the normal to the surface, which is beta. Based on those two pieces of information, which direction should I bounce? Right? So that's a function h. That's not the h from our sensors. Sorry about that. It's a collision. But um, what, what angle should I bounce at? That's what I want to ask. And more importantly, maybe, what sensors do I need to do the bounce? If I do a random bounce angle, I might need less than some other kind of sensor. So I like these kind of questions. And finally, ergodicity might be too strong. Here's another idea. It's called topologically transitive. In other words, I want to make sure that I just hit every open set. And that's all. I don't care if it's strongly uniform in the sense of ergodicity. So just hitting every open set might be enough. And also, what do I want to hit 
every open set of the state space, maybe just the boundary of the polygon, or maybe the boundary of the polygon cross which angle I came in at. So I can pick whatever subset C I care about and ask, is it topologically transitive? Did I hit every open set? Here's some stuff we're just starting to study. Uh, one of my students, Lars Erickson, is interested in these, these problems. So um, if you have a, uh, let's suppose the bounce is always normal to the surface. So I do not care about what angle I came in at, I only bounce normal. What happens? Well, you move away from corners. Right? So corners are like repelling in this case. Here's something really interesting. Let me uh, just go to the, the end slide here. Um, this is great. So um, we want to compute these automatically. This looks like a computational geometry kind of question. Here's what we have. If you go bouncing in this way using the normal bounce, as soon as the body gets past the green line and hits the wall, it can never get out. It's called a trap. Furthermore, it will go so far in that it will get past the purple line, and it will never get past that either. So this is like, a, my, my student Lars likes to call this um, to the right of the purple, what he calls that a black hole. And then to the right of the green line, he calls that the event horizon. So once you get beyond the green line, you will get pulled into the black hole and you cannot get out. You may have seen uh, domains of attractions, basins of attractions, and dynamical system theory. It's that kind of behavior going on. But on polygons, with, with, with what looks like reflections, but let's say weird kinds of reflections. Very interesting stuff. There should be a lot of open computational geometry kinds of questions here. And they're very practical for robotics, because I can make robots implement those. Implementing a perfect visibility sensor is not very easy on robots. But making robots bounce off of the walls, that's pretty easy. Right? So, so there's very good theoretical questions here that are very easy, very unexplored. Nobody else is doing this, as far as I know, except for, for my students. So um, that's about it. Um, how about another bounce? What about a right angle bounce? So I come in, and I go out exactly at a right angle, OK? With respect to what direction I came in from. What does that do? Well, it turns out that it's attracted to corners. So the robot will find corners then. The previous one went away. This one, right angle bounce, will go to two corners. I would like to automatically characterize these. You feed in a polygon and it will analyze all these kind of structures. All right, so here's the conclusion of that, that, that bit here. The general idea with wild bodies is let the bodies run wild rather than trying to stabilize them. Use physical or virtual gates to guide them gently. And use as little sensing and communication as possible, which fits the whole theme of this, this course. We're trying to design more systems of bodies and gates, trying to characterize the tasks we can solve, and doing analysis of these simple bouncing primitives, and some algorithmic design as well. Um, so let me give a summary of this. We, um, we use these filters of all the planning here. There's so many more things to do, I think, that are interesting here. But I would say we want to use these filters to make information space transitions. And then we plan directly in the information space. That's what I've been showing you. Uh, I gave some general planning issues, such as uh, reachability we talked about, for example, predictability. Um, and what we have to do is design these virtual sensors and filters and plan planning algorithms around a particular task. So I showed you several examples of that. Right? So although there's a lot of examples that we've shown you, I feel like we've barely scratched the surface, let's say. There's so many more possibilities. If you formulate the problems in this way, you can see that there's lots of interesting, very basic, fundamental kinds of questions. Um, I thought I had some more slides on how these things can be used, but let me give you an example. Um, just with the weasel ball alone, you could put a, a basic, um, or even these robots that move and bounce off the walls, what if you put a, a radio sensor inside that, that, that can, can um, sense the radio intensity? Maybe it's Wi-Fi signal intensity or first intensity from some radio tower. If I let it go bouncing around, I think it can do radio-based slam. It can make a map of its environment just by using the radio signal, a geometric map. So that's one use. I can put anything I want. I can sense temperature variations in a building and have this thing move around and do that. I can also shrink it down to a tiny scale, micro nano scale, where you have very little information you can get from sensors and actuators. And I might make strategies for very small particles to move around like that. It's a lot of different possibilities, I think, but, it's, but I, I'm interested in the fundamental research 
And then I would like to do collaborations with people who do maybe micro nano robotics or underwater robotics, all kinds of possibilities for using these systems. We've also made weasel balls on water. We have simple fins that we glued on them and they flap around in a fountain and go around and then bounce off of the sides of the fountain. We tried that. So different possibilities like that. So anyway, there's a lot of things to do on this. All right, any questions on this? I have one last quick part, and, and then I'll be, and then I guess we'll be done. So part six is just some kind of wrap up. I just want to say, you know, the, the, the future is exciting, and what are the possible futures here? Well, remember what I did. So this is just a summary. We had sensing. We started from sensing, starting from real sensors, and then built our way up. Remember that uh, virtual sensors typo there? Sensor mapping were all important. The, um, the pre-images were very important. We got up to the sensor lattice, right? And uh, then we did filters. Remember, we had spatial versus temporal. That was the big distinction. We talked about a general principle of triangulation. And then we had different kinds. We had information spaces and then different kinds of filters. Non-deterministic, probabilistic, combinatorial, which are a special kind of non-deterministic. And then I gave you three big examples, obstacles and beams, shadow information spaces, gap navigation trees. We did planning with perfect sensing, um, geometric representations, configuration spaces, sampling-based planning, combinatorial planning. I talked about feedback planning. There was some interest in that, right, where you design vector fields over the space um, to, to flow the robot to the goal. Then we did planning and information spaces. I went over general examples and then did a bunch of general characteristics of planning and then did a bunch of examples like maze searching, pursuit of evasion, um, gap navigation trees, uh, landmark-based navigation with convex hulls, bug algorithms, sensorless manipulation, oh, and then wild bodies. Um, remember the crucial points. Remember that um, the sensor is like a bread slicer, so we chop up. When I give you a sensor mapping, it chops up the state space into slices. And the goal is to understand for your task how big the slices can be. You would like to not measure everything. That's the point, right? Only measure what you need with the sensor to do your task. Don't try to measure so much that you reconstruct the full information of all the world around you. So that was a big idea, big idea of that. Um, so the basic uh, sensors embed nicely into a sensor lattice. You have these spatial filters and triangulations, which intersect for images. Uh, we have information spaces for temporal filtering. The planning problems that we have live in the information space. We describe it all in terms of information. And, um, and we, try to dissolve, we try to design all of these around a particular test. So those are key points. So what, what are we going to do? Well, I think we should try to design more families of virtual sensors. I gave you detection sensors, relational sensors, gap sensors, depth sensors, field-based sensors. What else should there be? Think about your robotics problem and what other family of nice virtual sensors should there be that provide critical pieces of information for the task that you want to solve. Um, I think we need to handle disturbance better. More uh, non-deterministic and probabilistic errors in the sensor measurements. Uh, how should we handle that? Uh, more sensor models that use state time space or uh, state trajectory space. And um, we want to continue to do experimental validation of different kinds of virtual sensor models and compare the physical alternatives. Uh, remember spatial filtering again, developing more families of triangulation methods. A lot of open problems there. Um, do we have some robust alternatives to standard uh, Bayesian least squares um, um, filtering? Um, so all sorts of the possibilities here. And Oh, that should be distributed, sorry, not distribution, but distributed asynchronous triangulation over the state time space. That's very interesting, right? If I have a bunch of sensors distributed around the environment and they get information in an asynchronous way, um, what should we um, do about it, right? What kind of filters can we make? It combines both spatial and temporal filtering. Um, under temporal filtering, I want to talk about um, information space uh, lattices and understand when one filter is better than another because it's been using better sensors. Um, so different possibilities inside of here, um, new combinatorial filters I want to try to design, how to generalize, extend, and adapt these shadow information spaces, obstacles and beams, and gap navigation trees. Um, we can do like simultaneous localization and mapping only in terms of obstacles and beams, things like that. 
in planning, I want to try to broaden things. I want to move beyond these particular examples I gave you, to try to, to have broader and broader families, um, to understand the complexity of information spaces. Maybe we can do sampling-based motion planning in the information space directly. There's some works that do this already. There's sampling-based planning in probabilistic information spaces. A couple of groups at MIT are doing that right now, for example. In Nick Roy's group and in uh, the group of uh, Tomas Lozano Perez are doing that. Um, and so um, maybe there's combinatorial planning in information spaces. Visibility-based pursuit evasion is one example of that, but there could be many more. Um, and so planning in shadow information spaces and optical and mean spaces and these gap tree spaces, still a lot of open work to do there. So, so I hope that you can take the course as a, an, an entrance to lots of different possible problems to explore. Um, I think you can also imagine how these information space ideas are related to theoretical computer science. So you're very accustomed to decidability and complexity. I want to make the analog of that in robotics. So with certain sensors and filters, what tasks can we accomplish? That's like decidability in computation, right? Can we do the task or not? And then complexity, how much does it cost to achieve the task? And how is that cost measured? I want to compare the power of these systems that we build with sensing, actuation, and computation. Similar to the way we compare DFAs and um, terrain machines and things like that. I believe the sensor lattices can help like that. Um, and there's some interesting connections between obstacles and beams and regular languages and automata. I'm not going to have to cover that too much. Um, I won't say anything about that. Um, let's see. I have a, um, a very simple example that relates to decidability. Um, imagine this. I have a, um, oh, two one-dimensional environments that are embedded in R3. It's a very simple example to kind of think about. What are the final ones? Um, so one of the environments looks like this, just a circle. That's E1. The other environment, if this is the XY plane here, the other environment is the other sorry, the other environment lives in three dimensions, and it's a helix that comes out of the board or goes into the board. But it projects directly onto the circle. So that's what E2 is, an infinite helix. And now let's suppose that the robot has what we call the projection sensor. It only tells you the first two coordinates. So I cannot tell if I'm coming out of the board or going into the board, I only know where I'm at in the projection onto the board. Two environments. Here's the motions I can do. I can move a little bit clockwise or a little bit counterclockwise. So all I can do is command motions that look like you're moving the robot like this. This way or this way. So I can give commands like that. Well, let's suppose I tell you there's a treasure somewhere, and you have to find it. Um, all right, so here, here, here we go. So let's think about this. So I, I tell you a treasure has been placed at an unknown location. Can you solve it, even if I do not tell you which environment you're in? Have you ever heard of the lost cow problem? No, cow path problem. If you're on the real number line and you're looking for a treasure, you go back and forth and back and forth. And if you double the amount you go each time, that ends up being an optimal strategy in terms of competitive ratios. So it's a common kind of example. You can do the lost cow. If you can imagine you're on the helix, then you just keep going back and forth. And it doesn't matter whether you're in E1 or E2, you'll be guaranteed to find the, the treasure. However, what if I tell you, I'm not sure there's a treasure. You decide for yourself. That one's not decidable, it turns out. You may go further and further and you don't know. But here's something really interesting, and it shows how these robotics problems are very closely coupled to decidability problems. Um, after you go all the way around once, what do you know? Right? What can you say after you go around once? I ask you to decide whether or not there's a treasure, and I do not tell you if you're an E1 or E2. So what is your information state? Well. It's, it's what I put in quotes there. You can say either the environment is a circle and it has no treasure, or the environment is a helix and there may or may not be a treasure. Very strange, right? So you're, you're learning something. People talk about SLAM, which is simultaneous localization and mapping. This is something simultaneous here. You're simultaneously learning about the map 
and something about the existence of a treasure. So all of these problems are coupled together. It's a very, very simple example, but it shows how um, these decidability issues and learning the map are all tightly coupled together. It's very interesting to think about these things. I like this kind of basic example. Uh, we did some work on comparing the power of robots. It's much like comparing the power of automata. I'm not going to go into that, but, but if you're interested, uh, if you like theory of computation, you might find this kind of work out interesting. It's in the International Journal of Robotics Research with Jason O'Kane. Uh, some of you have mentioned to me that you like some of his work, and, and um, uh, we can talk about that perhaps a little later. Um, one thing that happens over and over in this course that you might have seen is that these information spaces and these structures we find coincide with structures you know about in computational geometry. Why is that happening? And what else could we use from computational geometry when it comes to minimal sensing? I don't know. Here's two examples. The shortest path trees, or shortest path graph, was exactly what you can learn with the gap navigation trees. And with the relational sensor that looks at, that, that is able to sense the cyclic permutation of landmarks, provides exactly this convex hull structure that you know about. So it's very nice. These objects from computational geometry keep arising. And I think that's very interesting. Um, if we think about the connection between, so that's the connection between information spaces and computational geometry. If we think about how it's related to control theory, which is very big in robotics, I think control theory is estimation obsessive. In other words, they always try hard to get the state, no matter what. And then they pretend they have the state to do state feedback. So what I would like to do is um, do information feedback. So rather than doing X goes to you, as I said, I want to do I goes to you. The information states go to actions. Um, we also did some work recently that um, with, with a guy named Magnus Eggerstedt that, um, that, that kind of tries to rename the idea of open loop and control theory. We call it perfect time feedback. So if you try to bring that in alignment with the things we talk about in the course, if you want to do what they call open loop and control theory, it means you can measure time perfectly. And if you don't have perfect time measurements, it's actually even more open open loop, if you like. So, so it's a different way of looking at it. So some things you might find interesting. Um, final slide, this is the thing I really like. I, I feel like very often um, there's a lot of electrical, mechanical systems that people control, chemical systems, economic systems, and people apply control theory to that. It was developed sort of naturally by studying those problems. Theory of computation may um, provide some understanding of what you can and cannot do with computer systems, and also um, theory of algorithms. Very often I see people in these two fields, um, I want to include algorithms up there as well, and control theory, applying their ideas to robotics, right, and trying to say something about them. But I feel like there's a lot of unique challenges and a lot of unique problems in robotics because it is sensor-centric. You get your information from sensors, and then you control mechanical systems in the physical world, and there are a lot of really strange behaviors that happen. For example, this, right? And it's quite surprising. So it's important not to look at robotics as just an application of your theory, right? But to, think, to ask the question, what theory is natural for robotics? And then what kind of ideas, like the combinatorial way of reasoning in computational geometry is very useful, for example, for developing these kinds of theories. But you have to, in some sense, start with sensor-centric models, I feel, and build everything up from there. Um,